Welcome, comrade, to the Spectre of Communism podcast. We are at the International Executive Committee of the International Marxist Tendency. Forgive the slightly gonzo journalism style here. We're making do with what we have. Um, bit of a last minute decision, but we couldn't have a meeting involving some of the best minds from all over the international communists fighting to build the forces of revolution all over the world without taking the opportunity to sit down and talk to some of those leading comrades. And I'm very happy to start with Ben Morkin, who is our leading comrade in South Africa. He's based in Western Cape. And Ben, I'm really interested to hear about what the situation is like in South African politics. Obviously, South Africa has been on the news a lot recently, given the recent genocide case brought to the ICJ against Israel. But what's the the real story of the South African class struggle at this time? And how is it going in terms of building the forces of communism there? Well, thank you very much, Joe. Uh, It's very interesting times in South Africa. Um, You're right. I mean, externally, outside of the country, um, there's a lot of noise and a lot of news about this ICJ case. Um, but internally, in the in the country itself, uh, the ruling ANC has been in crisis for the last 30 years. And there's a lot of, a lot of factional fighting within the party itself. Um, you have the party really uh, split along three three factions fighting for control of the party. And this is, uh, the, the, the real result has been um, instability in, in the, uh, the ANC itself, in the fighting uh, for control of the ANC. And the latest development is that um, just last week, the former president of the country, uh, Jacob Zuma, was actually suspended as a member of the ANC because he uh, refused to campaign for the ANC this, uh, this, this uh, later this year for the elections. And he has endorsed a new uh, political formation called uh, MK, which is uh, the former uh, armed wing of the ANC. The history of this is really the class struggle that's been unfolding for the last uh, 30 years, especially the period between 2009 and 2013. There was a real upsurge in the class struggle. Um, the workers have lost a lot of movement in uh, on the industrial front. Workers, uh, that, that was the time where the Marikana massacre happened and so on. Uh, that's in 2012 when the police opened fire on uh, mine workers, um, they shot down more than, uh, I think, 112 miners were shot down, uh, 34 were killed for uh, demanding a living wage, demanding better salaries. And that that, that was a real shock because uh, the ANC is uh, the history of the liberation movement, the fight against apartheid. Um, That was the method that the apartheid government used whenever the the workers would would rise up and demand better life. So to see that the ANC is now defending the profits of the bosses, against the same mine workers who have been struggling for, for better living conditions. That was a, a real turning point in the situation. And that, um, that really led, lead, led to the fragmentation of the ANC, especially along class lines. Um, it led to a split in the trade union movement. It led to all kinds of divisions and split f- fractional uh, infighting within the ANC. And that's really, that's really what is behind the current events in the country, the current instability within the ANC itself. And the ANC historically has deep roots in South African society. I mean, it goes right back to uh, even before uh, apartheid as officially the policy of the of the former um, colonial and and, and um, colonial powers and the, the national government that came to power. So it is a long history. Of course, to the ANC's left, you have the EFF, the Economic Freedom Fighters. Mm-hmm who recently had their 10th anniversary rally, which I believe you attended. Yes, right. um, can you tell me a bit about the movement behind the EFF? What kind of state is the party in? Obviously, there's a huge amount of crisis and demand for change within South African society. And is this party tapping into this? Well, in 2013, um there was uh, the, br- the breakaway of uh, the, the Metal Workers Union, NUMSA, which is the, the biggest u- uh, union in the country. And it, at around the same time, uh, just before that actually, um, the leadership of the ANC Youth League was suspended was, and expelled because they, have, they were defending uh, a more left-wing program. Um, and this is where the history of the, of the economic freedom fighters come from, is the expelled leaders of the ANC, ANC Youth League. But uh, subsequently, 
I mean, the, 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 the economic freedom fighters is actually a very con- contradictory organization. I mean, the, there is uh, socialist elements, obviously, but the biggest faction of this organization is um, based on pan-Africanism, uh, African nationalism. Um, and the only thing that's really kept the party uh, intact is the two things, basically. It's the authority of the leadership. Julius Malema, the president of the, of the ANC, Although his, uh, his deputy is more, uh, Floyd Chivambo, he's more of a socialist uh, element. And so the leadership has kept the organization together, but also they've, they've not been tested, they've not, they've, they've not been in government and, um, on national level. So they haven't really been tested um, that, you know, by, by events themselves. But uh, the, this contradictory uh, nature of the economic freedom fight is really based on different class formations because Pan-Africanism rest on different class, uh, different class basis than uh, than Marxism. It's the rest on the working class, um, and so this 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 fault line that runs straight through the organization has been uh, d- dilapidating the of holding back the the real development of the organization. There was young people, the socialists, uh, socialists uh, are looking for a class based uh, um, way out of this out of this crisis. But it's been held back by um, it's because the leadership they still believe they can implement their program on a capitalist basis. When we have to say that uh, that is a recipe for disaster. That is exactly what the ANC has done mm. uh, 30 years ago. And finally, how have we been doing in terms of building the forces of genuine communism in South Africa? Well, we've been actually we're doing very well in uh, especially in uh, some of the important centres. In, in the country, uh, in Cape Town, um, there's an industrial city in East London, um, Durban, and also the capital Pretoria. We have we have uh, building the forces steadily for a number of years now, and um, we've tapped into this mood on especially with young, um, with the, the so-called born free generation. That that generation that was supposed to be born into freedom after 1994, they're really young. Um, class fighters who, who, uh, who have only known the crisis of capitalism the whole the entire life with in which uh, youth unemployment is now much bigger than it was under the days of apartheid and so this this is radic- radical layer of youth that is um, prepared to, uh, to to look for to the ideas of marxism and what what is quite interesting is we talk about the economic freedom fighters and um, the uh, ANC Youth League and, and this uh, Young Communist League, all of these are formations. Um, inter- what is interesting is that many of the, many of the members write to us um, and want to have a dialogue um, about Marxism, about the- Marxist theory, theory, and so on. Because this this is really the, our strength and the weakness of this organization. They're more like activist types organizations. Uh, going from one movement to another. They were building the forces of communism, of real, genuine communism, based on the ideas of Marx. And we're looking forward to uh, meeting you guys. If people want to join us in the fight for, for communism, to fight for genuine communism, not, not the reformist type that is, that is currently implemented by the ANC and economic freedom fighters and these uh, type of organizations. And we're looking forward to having you as uh, as as comrades in struggle. Fantastic. Well, we'll put a link to where young communists or communists of any age in South Africa can reach out and find out more about getting organized with the IMT. Ben, it's always a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you. And here we have Jorge Martin, leading member of the IMT. And I wanted to speak to you about the situation in Argentina. At the end of last year, you had this wacky libertarian elected Millet and there was lots of scaremongering about oh fascism fascism a big movement's opened up in Argentina recently and I wanted to get uh, your thoughts on what Millet represents uh, why he was elected and also what is the nature of this movement that's just beginning to build against him Yes, Millet is is quite scary. He he describes himself as an anarcho-capitalist, and basically his idea is an ultra-liberal idea. He wants to do away with all state uh, intervention in the economy or any regulations of uh, environmental kinds, um, labor rights, subsidies, subsidies to people, subsidies to companies, no regulations of foreign trade. Uh, he, he said he wants to abolish the central bank, dollarize the economy, 
Um, so how can a person who has such an extreme program be elected in uh, Argentina to power? And in order to understand this, you need to go back a little bit. The government before Milei was the government of Alberto Fernandez and Cristina Fernandez Kirchner. So that's the Peronist government. The Peronist uh, uh, understood to be kind of center left is, is a bourgeois nationalist government, if you want to describe it in one way, but always appealing to the working class, the poor and so on. Uh, and before that government, there was the government of Macri. Macri came to power in 2014 and attempted to carry out some of the measures that now Millet wants to introduce, including the counter-reform of the pension system, the counter-reform of the labor law. His attempts kind of floundered halfway. There was big movement of the workers, a couple of general strikes, and finally he was removed and he was replaced by the Peronists. And people thought that the Peronists were going to carry out different policies, more pro-worker, pro-poor policies, but this was not the case. Alberto Fernandez in power carried out policies which were, maybe they, they didn't consist on massive attacks, but they, they were also cap managing the capitalist crisis, which is very severe in Argentina, and therefore uh, it, it meant a general worsening of the working conditions, the living standards, uh, at the end of the Fernandez government, I think over 40% of people live uh, under the poverty uh, line. Inflation had already shot up to 200%. And uh, about 50, over 50% 50 of those who are in work are in precarious conditions. I, they don't have collective bargaining, they work in casual jobs, uh, short hours and so on. So the situation had become really, really bad under the Alberto Fernandez government. And so when Millet came in and he said, I'm going to attack the political caste, I'm going to attack the rich and powerful, uh, they've uh, let the country down. So it's not surprising that he had a certain appeal. He was the outsider, the anti he presented himself as the anti-establishment candidate at a time when people had tried uh, a right-wing government and a so-called Peronist center-left government, and both had failed them. So uh, there was general discrediting of all bourgeois political institutions, and some people just wanted a radical change. There were even people who voted for Millet, who said, look, I don't agree with this program, but at least we're going to get rid of the current lot, which is not uh, that they've, done not, uh, they've not done any, anything for us. Uh, there's another factor. Millet received about 30% of the votes in the first round of the presidential election, and then in the runoff, he got the support of the main bourgeois parties, i.e. Macri and his, his party, which is kind of coalition of different parties. But the right wing, the, the official traditional right wing, threw, his, threw their lot behind uh, Millet and allowed him to win by, by a sizable margin against the, the candidate of the failed Peronist government, which was Massa. Massa was actually the finance minister under the Alberto Fernandez government who was seen by many people as responsible for the economic disaster of the country. But not only that, Massa had already uh, promised to uh, deliver IMF cuts. He, he, is, uh, seen, he is a man of the IMF in the country, his personal friend of the US ambassador. So he was no match for someone who presents himself as an outsider. He was no alternative. So basically, this is the reasons that led to the victory of Millet. Now, once Millet was in power, the beginning of December, he went in with a change, so, uh, as he had promised. He introduced uh, a national urgency decree, this is a, a piece of uh, legislation, in which he did away with, I think, about 300 laws, regulations, uh, subsidies, and so on. And then on top of this, he then presented what he calls an omnibus law, a law covering many different aspects, which I think he wants to repeal or reform, change about 600 pieces of legislation. So this is a massive uh, onslaught. A massive onslaught against whom? It's not a massive onslaught against the caste or the rich and the powerful. It's a massive onslaught against the working class and the poor. And people have rightly seen this. Millet's popularity has gone down very sharply since he was uh, elected in only in December. And uh, obviously people see that the situation has worsened for the poor, not for the rich. All his measures, these measures are really bad. For instance, he's uh, abolished the indexing 
of pensions with inflation. So it means that immediately the pensioners, the poorest in the country, are going to lose a lot of money. He's uh, lifted subsidies on fuel, which Im impacts the prices of transportation. He wants to destroy labor rights, including the right to strike, the right to assembly. Uh, on top of this, Bullrich, the, f the, 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 uh, the Home Office Minister, the Interior Minister, has introduced uh, a decree curtailing the right to demonstrate freedom of expression and so on. You can only demonstrate uh, in, uh, on the pavement, not, in the, uh, not uh, blocking the roads. And so this obviously led already in December to a big explosion of protest. People came out spontaneously on the streets, banging pot pots and pans, as, as is traditional in, in Argentina. There was the reformation of people's assemblies, which had emerged in 2001, when the, the, the last big explosion of the class struggle. And then the unions, which in Argentina are extremely bureaucratic and conservative, they uh, were forced by the mood that existed to call a general strike. This is the earliest the, that the general strike has ever been called against uh, uh, an Argentinian government after the swearing in of, the new, uh, of a new government. Uh, so there was a, a big general strike on the 24th of January. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people came out on strike and even more came out to the demonstrations. The demonstrations across the country were 1.5 million strong. The idea that they were not going to block certain roads in Buenos Aires went out of the window. The police couldn't do anything about it. And this was, a, uh, on the one hand, it was a big show of strength of the working class. People are not prepared to see all their rights and, uh, and conquests and living standards attacked in this uh, massive way. Uh, on the other hand, it was also a, a, a demonstration of, of the ability of the trade union bureaucrats to maybe contain the movement within certain safe channels. This week, there were demonstrations outside Congress when, when Congress was discussing this so-called omnibus law. And uh, there was police repression at this time. The numbers were lower. Trade union bureaucrats were nowhere to be seen. They had not called for this. Uh, so. But in general, what I think is that this attempt by Millet to introduce so many attacks all in one go, what is producing is preparing for a massive explosion of the class struggle. There's no, no question of this being fascism. In, in, if, you, if we understand fascism for, for the physical smashing of the working class, tens of thousands uh, killed, people in prison and stuff like that, he doesn't have the strength for that. In fact, even his measures that he's trying to implement, he's had to make concessions already because he doesn't have a parliamentary majority. Now, the question is, even if you defeat uh, Millet, the situation of the Argentinian economy is pretty bad. Mm. So what, what the Argentinian Congress of the IMT are saying is it's not enough to fight against this government. The struggle needs to be organized along class struggle methods, mass assemblies in the, in the factories and workplaces, the election of democratic coordination committees made up of shop stewards, elected representatives from the factories uh, in, an, in an escalating plan. It's not just a 12 hour general strike, but, but a plan of action that leads to what? Leads to what? For first of all, stopping the government, but then overthrowing the government, posing the question of, of workers' power. Workers should come to power. Workers are really the only ones who can solve this crisis by taking the economy into their own hands and running it in the benefit of the majority, uh, as opposed to uh, the IMF controlling the economy, dictating massive cuts in uh, public spending, pri massive privatization of everything, and, and so on. And this is the alternative that's, that uh, is being posed in, um, in Argentina. And uh, the election of Millet has just uh, accelerated the crisis mm -hmm. and the social explosion that's being prepared. Jules is a leading comrade from the French section of the IMT, and France is a country that last year was rocked by a series of very significant protests and strike movements. There was this hated hike to the retirement age that mm -hmm. Macron had to force through the National Assembly with no votes. And in recent days, we've seen Paris surrounded by tractors a protest movement led by angry farmers. So it seems that France is a bit of a powder keg, Jules. Um, what's the situation um, back home? Yeah, thanks for having me uh, here. But yeah, uh, the thing is, uh, Macron's government uh, have no uh, majority since its uh, re-elections in uh, 2022. And uh, 
but he still uh, the bourgeoisie French bourgeoisie French ruling class still needs a lot of Uh, very uh, important reforms, attacks on uh, living standard, standards to, to stay competitive, in fact, on the world market. So he, he tried, he's forced to push these kind of reforms uh, without having a majority in parliament, without having uh, a base of support in the country to, to, to support him, in fact. And uh, so this is what uh, produced this... Uh, crisis, in fact, of the, of the regime, for, so to say. And uh, last year, effectively, when he tried uh, to push first this reform into parliament, uh, at one point it, bec it became clear, clear that he wouldn't be able to do so. So he was forced to, to mobilize almost every tricks in French con constitution to push forward law without vote. And there's quite a lot in the uh, French constitution of uh, little tricks, little uh, constitution articles, um, making it possible to, to push a law, to adopt a law without uh, a vote. And uh, in the end, it was forced to mobilize even the Constitutional Council, that is um, the legal supreme uh, court of uh, France. And uh, we was forced to debate, to discuss this law and uh, vote him, uh, adopt it. Uh, in uh, being protected by police for the first time of its uh, existence. And uh, it was uh, a very peculiar scene because this is supposed to be the kind of things that the bourgeoisie keep in reserve. Almost every movement since uh, a few years have been uh, heavily repressed. We had uh, a lot of police violence, a lot of uh, banned Uh, demonstrations, uh, attacks on uh, demonstrators, and uh, it, it took uh, sometimes even a funny, f almost awkward forms. Last year, a demonstration against uh, on, a, on a ecological topic was uh, repressed by uh, policemen on uh, ATV bikes, shooting at uh, demonstrators from the back of the ATV while uh, driving. It's weird scenes, uh, but in fact. Uh, Uh, heavy repression and uh, these uh, kind of things are a reflect of the heightened uh, uh, class struggle in the country, in fact. We have had a mass mobilization almost uh, every year or every two years since uh, eight years, in fact, since uh, the big mobilization against the labor law in uh, 20, uh, 2016. And uh, this forced the ruling class to have more and more, uh, to mobilize more and more police violence and uh, all the constitutional and legal tricks to repress uh, the movement. The other side to this is uh, that police viol violence in itself become a, a topic of mobilization, as we've mm. seen this summer with uh, the death of uh, Nael and uh, these big uh, ex social explosions in uh, almost every part of the country, even in, uh, in very small towns of uh, 200, 300 the inhabitants, You had big, big uh, kind of riots in small places in the in very rural er areas, mm. and uh, this this is another expression of the very deep anger uh, growing in the in, in the mass of the population, and it's the same thing with the with the farmers' protest. Uh, it's a very small layer of the population. There must be around 300,000 of them. But they're a small layer, but they have been supported and uh, their movement have been uh, approved by a vast majority of the, of the country. Mm. Because I think anyone attacking uh, the government now on something looking a bit uh, progressive, that is, I don't have enough money at the end of the month to eat. Anyone attacking the government now on this kind of uh, slogans is supported by the majority of the, of the country. In fact, it, it's a reflect of the very deep and very uh, massive anger against the regime and against uh, French capitalism, in fact. And uh, for, the, uh, for the French bourgeoisie, it is becoming uh, an issue because uh, Macron is supposed to stay in power with his government for uh, three years more, and uh, nobody thinks uh, that it will be possible to continue to rule for three years like this 
with mass movement and mass demonstration at each point, at each big reform. You will have uh, 100,000 people or millions of people in the street. At one point, it will be uh, impossible for the bourgeoisie to, to continue. But the thing is, they have no alternative mm. because uh, the two main traditional parties, uh, Socialist Party and uh, the Republicans Party, the traditional Gaullist uh, right-wing bourgeois party, both are in a deep crisis. Uh, both uh, made very little scores uh, at the last presidential elections. Both are deeply divided and both are discredited because uh, since uh, b b uh, during decades, they have always uh, implemented uh, counter-reforms, uh, deep cuts and all this. So they are deeply discredited. And the only uh, big party appearing as an uh, opposition to Macron, for now, is uh, Marine Le Pen uh, National Rally. To be clear, in case anyone isn't aware, National Rally is the new name for National Front. Oh, yes. Yes, that's it. And uh, Marine Le Pen, as a daughter of her father, is yeah, deeply hated by a whole layer of the population. Not only the, the uh, migrants and uh, immigrants, and not only them, but a majority of the youth and a big part of the of the workers and, and the population still hates her, hates her father, hates her party, and uh, the risk for the bourgeoisie to have uh, a kind of um, a Meloni in Italy, something like Meloni in Italy, with a coming to power of Marine Le Pen, would be a would uh, risk to to put in the streets uh, hundreds of thousands of youth of uh, angry people mm. wanting to 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 take off take over the, the the whole place. In fact, sounds like a ripe situation for genuine communists to win authority, to win people over, to connect with this angry mood. Yes, and uh, that's why we were trying to do and uh, to build the, the, the French section of uh, international Marxist tendency. One last detail to add. Jules, go ahead. Uh, yeah, another um, situation is becoming, uh, had become even more uh, complicated since, as the government has no majority, is forced to lean on the right wing and even on Marine Le Pen party mm. to rule. And uh, a few month, few weeks ago, uh, a new law was adopted by the National Assembly, a law on uh, an anti-immigration law, in fact, uh, that was negotiated, that was, uh, in fact, negotiated between the government and the party of Marine Le Pen. And it pra in practice, the law voted and uh, adopted by the National Assembly was Marine Le Pen's law. Mm. But... After this, uh, the government, uh, Macron, called in the Constitutional Council again to ask him to put out of the law the part who were too extreme, the part that Marine Le Pen wanted the most. So you had again a Constitutional Council that is supposed to be a last recour recourse of the bourgeoisie, of the, of, of the ruling class order, put forward, discredited once more, and... Uh, the government uh, being discredited also because uh, it was elected in uh, 2022 uh, as a, a kind of uh, protection against Marine Le Pen. It was uh, called to vote for Macron. If not Le Pen, if if you do, if you don't, Le Pen will go in uh, in power. And not even two years after, is putting is uh, order, ordering his deputies in the National Assembly to adopt Marine Le Pen law. It, uh, it had a big impact even on, uh, on layers of the middle class and its own electorate who were shocked, in fact, by this uh, turn to the right, even at uh, such extreme. Mm -hmm. It uh, deepened uh, even more the crisis of uh, its government. So uh, it's a question of time before it finished to fall. And we're here on day two of filming at the International Executive Committee, and we're very privileged to have Paras, who is a leading comrade with our Pakistan section. So Paras, Pakistan is in the grip of a very severe crisis. Um, could you tell us a bit more about what's going on? Yes, comrade, 
आई थिंक पाकिस्तान कैन बी कंसिडर द लिविंग हेल ऑन द अर्थ मिलियंस ऑफ पीपल्स आर लिविंग इन कैटस्ट्राफिक सिचुएशन पॉवर्टी मिजरी अनएम्प्लॉयमेंट इन्फ्लेजन अर्थ को एक्स फ्लड्स डिसप्लेसमेंट्स ईच एंड एवरी ब्लैसिंग ऑफ कैपिटलिज्म हैज़ डिस्ट्रॉयड द लाइफ ऑफ कामन पाकिस्तानी पीपल एंड द रूलिंग क्लास ऑफ पाकिस्तान दे आर मॉरली पोलिटिकली एंड इकनॉमिकली सो करप्ट दैट दे आर इवन मेकिंग मनी फ्राम ऑल द मिजरीज ऑफ द पीपल इन द इन दिस सिचुएशन एंड ऑन एट्थ ऑफ फेबररी देर आर जनरल इलेक्शन आर शेड्यूल्ड इन पाकिस्तान बट द लेवल ऑफ अनसर्टेनिटी इज सो हाई दैट इवन टूडे जस्ट फोर फाइव डेज आर ऑन टू द जनरल इलेक्शन नो वन इज श्योर दैट इलेक्शन विल बी हेल्ड और नॉट बिकॉज देर इज सीरियस वेव ऑफ टेररिस्ट अटैक्स गोइंग ऑन इन द एरियाज ऑन द बॉर्डर ऑफ ईरान एंड ऑन द बॉर्डर ऑफ अफगानिस्तान एंड इवन वन ऑफ द कैंडिडेट हु इज़ कंटेस्टिंग फॉर नेशनल असम्बली इज किल्ड एंड मैनी वर्कर्स ओवर डूइंग द इलेक्शन कंपेन दे आर बींग अटैक्ड एंड मैनी आर इंजर्ड एंड मैनी आर हॉस्पिटलाइज देर आर वेरी सीवियर क्राइसिस इन फैक्ट द इन फाइट एंड द सिविल वार ऑफ द पाकिस्तानी स्टेट दैट इज़ नाउ बींग अंडर आउट ऑफ कंट्रोल मैनी जनरल्स आर्मी जनरल्स दे आर बींग कोर्ट मार्शल for the last uh, six to seven months and uh, many have been uh, kept house arrest and uh, similarly the many uh, judges uh, they are uh, uh, under uh, severe attacks and uh, uh, three of the main uh, judges of supreme court uh, they had to resign recently and uh, many uh, tv anchors many uh, renowned uh, journalists many Uh, intellectuals they are being harassed they are being tortured they are being arrested the only relatively polit- uh, popular leader uh, whose name uh, who is ex prime minister of pakistan imran khan he is also in prison mm. and uh, his party although that is a right wing party and to some extent some people say that there is a extreme right wing party they are also uh, the party is uh, facing straight repression as well and uh, now uh, thousands of workers are uh, arrested and and uh, the the other leader who has been three time prime minister nawaz sharif who was in self exile he uh, just before the election he reached uh, back pakistan and uh, and uh, most probably he is going to be the next prime minister as well and uh, the other uh, main party that is called ppp pakistan peoples party that was the traditional working class party as well but now they are also uh, just the the stooge of uh, a faction of pakistan state and they are also maneuvering for the big pop, uh, share in the coming uh, elections pakistan uh, almost uh, officially has bank bank corrupted but they are not uh, declaring on the very last day imf signed a deal with pakistan to save official bankruptcy but uh, after that and uh, if new government formed they have no uh alternate economic program and they are uh, now brutally implementing the imf program that that is the program of downsizing right sizing uh, uh privatization and uh, already inflation in pakistan is officially in, uh, has reached to the 37% and un officially it's too high more than that people who were uh, uh, affected from the last year floods Uh, they are still there are about 30 million people who was uh, directly or indirectly directly affected they are still waiting for some kind of help from the uh, state and this situation is very uh, brutal but it doesn't mean that people are just bearing the things and they are not uh, revolting against it the, and uh, in fact we have seen uh, very big a uh, political uprising recently in pakistan especially uh, if we talk about the uh, kashmir there is very important Uh, region in pakistan on the in the mountains and there is uh, about uh, f- for the last 6 uh, to 7 months there is very serious uh, movement that is uh, like a civil disobedience obedience movement and uh, millions of people uh, they are not paying electricity bills 
and uh, they are protesting still uh, the the most important thing about that movement was the first time in the history of kashmir the women uh, of kashmir that is you know is very uh, backward areas kind of tribal society and uh, the women first time they uh, were asked by the leadership of the movement to join uh, in, uh, to uh, organize solidarity campaign for the movement and then they uh, the women came in hundreds in small towns and villages of kashmir where they are even not allowed to walk freely in the bazaars in the streets uh, on the border of kashmir there is a uh, other uh, mountainous uh, region that is called gilgit and that is also on the border of china and uh, on that region the the government has cut the uh, flower sub subsidies and uh, raised the uh, uh, price of bread very high and uh, people of gilgit also retaliated against these policies and the children women and the old people even and the youngsters they are on the streets and they uh, uh, march from the villages to the towns and they organize very big protests and they forced government to take back the decision to cut the subsidy that it's a very big victory but the most significant movement recently we saw in the baloch uh, uh, nation that is very oppressed and on the border of iran we saw uh, historic uh, uh, scenes when the children when the women and the most important thing the this movement is uh, totally uh, the baloch movement is organized by the women the young women and uh, in balochistan young women and women they are most uh, mostly uh, no can imagine that the women can lead this kind of movement but the repression is uh, rising day by day and hundreds of political activists are missing and missing and many are killed uh, and uh, we found recently uh, collective graves uh, uh, in the rural areas of balochistan the incident that uh, sparked the movement that was two uh, young students were uh, uh, kidnapped by state uh, security agencies and uh, after the protests they had to produce them before the court but when court uh, gave the judicial custody to the, uh, the the authorities and to the police they killed uh, students in the custody and they thrown their uh, bodies on the road and uh, this uh, sparked the whole the anger and first the parents of the students they decided not to bury the bodies and they kept uh, the bodies on the uh, road and they started protest and the whole village and then the town they uh, participated in the uh, protest after the uh, after two or two and a half month the movement is still going on and uh, they marched under the leadership of young women they marched to the capital where uh, police uh, once again uh, baton charged them and misbehaved the young women and the videos of the, their misbehaves uh, went viral and that sparked even more fury and more anger in the uh, baloch area even in the uh, karachi because karachi also is the biggest city of baloch as well and uh, the south southern punjab where uh, uh, many baloch live the, the we saw the historic protests in in solidarity with the young women and uh, against the uh, state so now this the, uh, and uh, uh, you know the pashtun movement is also uh, that was uh, started in 2018 that was also that is that still also con continues although it, uh, that uh, weakens a lot but uh, uh, and the, their leader manzur pashtun is also in prison and uh, uh, but the, their their party is also under state repression but young pashtuns are uh, trying to uh, fight all the repression and uh, the significant thing is that that all these movements are in the peripheries but the cities are uh, relatively calm now uh, and uh, there had been working class movements but they were isolated and the trade union bureaucrats they uh, misled the movements and they are defeated but now once again the public sector uh, servants movements is uh, uh, now start uh, once again in punjab and teachers and health sector they are uh, trying to resist the Uh, privatization of health and uh, education sector uh, essence of these movements is very progressive because it is mobilizing uh, mil uh, hundreds and uh, thousands of young uh, women and men but at the same time the leadership is has its limits uh, is very significant uh, period of 
Pakistani uh, politics because uh, the, all the bourgeois parties are uh, bankrupted and no one uh, trusts them. All the state institutions are bankrupted, no one trusts them. And uh, uh, on the other hand, the middle classes started to mobilize and uh, uh, we, uh, we saw significant working class movements uh, in 2011, 2013 of electricity workers, of uh, airline workers, but they were defeated. But at that time, this mid middle class was mobilized in favor of Imran Khan and they were openly uh, supporting privatization and liberal program. At that time when uh, uh, Pakistan working class was started to move, the middle class was used in organized way by the rulers to harass the working class movement. But now when this is a new uh, epoch uh, and in, 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 in which we say we are uh, witnessing historic uh, developments because the petty bourgeoisie that was uh, in the past mobilized against the working class, they are uh, now uh, already mobilized against the state itself. And if in these circumstances the uh, working class movement uh, workers uh, start to move, that will be an interesting situation. And in that situation, the uh, Marxist uh, will have uh, many opportunities to put forward the, uh, the uh, political solution of national question, of women question, and uh, each and every question uh, from the class point of view, from the Marxist perspective. And uh, we can see that we are uh, just entering in a pre-revolutionary situation in Pakistan. Fantastic. And I know that the comrades in our Pakistan section are busy building the revolutionary communist leadership that the working class needs. Paras, la salam. La salam. And last, but certainly not least, we have a communist from the belly of the beast. We have John Peterson, who is a leading comrade from the United States. John, uh, it's an election year. Biden's bombing the Middle East. What's going on in the States? What's going on in the States? What isn't going on in the United States? Mm. I mean, uh, technically, everything should be uh, rolling along nice and smooth. You've got uh, the economy, on the, you know, at least technically speaking, is in very good shape, very low unemployment officially, and yet 56% of Americans think that the economy is already in a recession. You have a presidential campaign where you have basically two former presidents uh, running against each other. Seems you know, 99.999% certain that Trump's going to be the Republican candidate, barring some really bizarre twist of uh, twist of history. Uh, so you have this rematch of uh, two of the most hated candidates ever. Uh, rematch from 2020, happening again this year. Obviously, the world situation, the economic situation, the, the pressure cooker of American society, it's all on a much higher level than it was a few years ago. And, uh, you know, only 42% of Americans are satisfied with these presidential options. They, they would like to have different options. So great dissatisfaction in the country. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the, you know, American politics is a is, uh, is uh, I mean, a lot of people laugh about it these days, but for the for Marxists, what this all really expresses is the underlying discontent in society, breaking from this idea of lesser evilism, which has gripped the minds of so many Americans for so many electoral cycles. Already, many many people have uh, have, have have are breaking with that. Uh, and and you're right, this bombing of the of the Middle East, not just you know bombing uh, Syria, Iraq, and so on, but the 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 open you know very. Uh, blatant support for Netanyahu's mass murder in uh, the Gaza Strip has just broken so many people from, from any illusions they may have had that the Democrats can in any way be considered a lesser evil. So come, you know, from our perspective, we already know that one of the parties of the ruling class is going to win. There is no uh, workers candidate. There is no viable mass working class party, a socialist party, a labor party, a communist party, which is what we ultimately need in the United States is a mass communist party, but that doesn't exist yet. We're obviously in the process of, of laying the foundations for that kind of a party. We can maybe talk about that a little bit later. But uh, people, I, I think a lot of people are going to sit this one out. And if Trump does win, obviously a lot of people on the left, a lot of liberals, are, uh, are, are talking about the, the threat to, to democracy. We should be clear that we're talking about the threat to bourgeois democracy, which is democracy for the few. It's not democracy in any uh, meaningful sense for the, for the majority, for the working class. Uh, it's, it's, there is a threat to democracy, but it's because the system itself isn't democratic uh, from start to finish. It's a, it's, a, it's a country, it's a system where uh, everything is actually dominated, not by politics, but by, by the big capitalist interest, by the Fortune 500, by the biggest corporations, which control roughly 70% of GDP 
uh, and just these uh, these 500 corporations. So uh, I don't think we're going to see uh, you know the rise of fascism, which is what a lot of people on the left seem to say, but actually a huge almighty backlash, mass mobilizations that are going to dwarf what we saw uh, on election night in 2020 and uh, could could quite quickly under these conditions build into something even bigger and broader than what we saw in the summer of 2020, which let's not forget was the biggest mass movement in American history, around 26 million Americans on the streets, uh, you know, every big city, every small city, every little town, every demographic coming out fighting against racism, against the murder of George Floyd, uh, this movement that started in Minneapolis and spread around the country and really around the world, uh, that was just a, a harbinger of things to come in the belly of the beast. Mm. And it's a situation where the conditions for a revolutionary mood to grip the masses are absolutely ripe. And I was really privileged to listen in to an extremely uh, inspiring commission by the American comrades uh, a couple of days ago about the incredible successes you guys have been having. I mean, the communists seem to be killing it in the States right now. Could you tell us a bit more about the kind of growth you've seen and the kinds of mood and the kind of attitude you're hearing from young people, from workers, about the growing popularity of communist ideas in the USA? Sure. I mean, when we started building the U.S. section 25 years ago, people would say there's no way you're going to ever find any communist, not even one communist in the United States. But of course, where there's one, there's many. And we know that everything eventually turns into its opposite, that similar conditions lead to similar results. And uh, understanding how dialectics work and how, how history works, we knew that eventually those conditions would lead to, to the massive transformations of consciousness. I mean, everything from you know, September 11th to the 2008 crisis to the Arab Spring, the Occupy movement, I mean, uh, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, all these things which have cumulatively led to a situation where millions of young people literally consider themselves communists. I mean, they completely reject the other uh, the other alternatives. They've tested them out. They've seen their parents test them out. They've seen their parents uh, or themselves even play by the rules, as they say, get a job, buy a house, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and you, you can never get ahead. And meanwhile, the richest people in the world are twice as rich as they were in, uh, in 2020. Uh, the big oil companies are, are you know, burning up the planet and uh, have massively increased their profits. And, and, and these issues, you know, injustice, racial inequality, sexism, the environment, the climate crisis, have really radicalized this new generation of youth who just don't believe the lies or never even grew up hearing the lies about uh, uh, communism, where they equate communism, genuine, revolutionary, liberating communism, the ideas of Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Trotsky, they were equated with Stalin and, and, and with all the, all, you know, all the evils that, that happened in the Soviet Union, the betrayals of, of those genuine ideals by the Stalinist bureaucracy. Of course, we've explained the reasons for all that before, but now we have uh, this new generation of, of, of young class fighters. Uh, in just the last few months, the last five months, really, we've more than doubled our forces. We've recruited hundreds, literally hundreds of young communists over the last few months. And uh, it has obviously also transformed the work of the section. We are now much more of a genuine national presence uh, with, with some, some important strongholds in some of the bigger cities, some of the bigger areas of the country. And uh, I mean, if anybody out there isn't yet a member of the IMT, wants to be not just anti-capitalist, not just the communist, but actually wants to get organized to fight for the socialist revolution in our lifetime, which will lay the foundations for communism on a world scale, then, then they, they, should, uh, they should contact us right away and get involved in this struggle. Well, I think that's an amazing note to end on. And just to echo what John says, if you're sick of this rotten, decrepit capitalist system and want to fight for communism, then get in touch. We have a presence in over 40 countries all over the world. I'll put links in the description to this episode. That's it from us at the IEC. We're back next week with a new episode on the Spectre of Communism podcast. For now, solidarity and let's build socialism and communism in our lifetimes. Do it. Thank you.